I'm Sandy Moriarty. Uh, Ron gave you a little bit of my background. I have been here a long time. I am older than dirt. I'm not a native. But um, I have been here a relatively long time, I guess, for, for the average Sedona resident. So I have seen the wine industry grow here. I got involved with uh, John Marcus's vineyard first. Well, that was, I'm sure it was at least. And, and Paula Woolsey, sitting to my left, is your right, is uh, my personal wine guru. So if you have a question about wine, this is the person to ask, not me. I am not. Jim uh, Eaton asked me, said to me this morning, I didn't know you were a wine expert. And I said, I'm not. I'm just a major wino. <laughs> so that's, that's my only claim to fame. But I, I did found uh, um, the Sedona Wine Fest. We have had our fifth event in 2013, and so I'll be talking about that a little bit later. I'd like to introduce you to the rest of the panel. To my right, your left, is Laura Vandegrift, who uh, is the owner-operator of Sedona Wine Country Tours. Laura's a professional tour guide, um, worked for many years in Phoenix, and uh, is, as a tour operator, a tour director, president of the Arizona Guides Association, the operations manager of a tour company, and a former park ranger at Montezuma Castle National Monument. Uh, a founding member of the National Tourism Organization. She's a teacher and trainer for International Tour Directing School, and she was a training consultant with a major communications company. But she, she moved here about eight years ago and started Sedona Wine Country Tours. And uh, she, she's been, she really got involved. She actually went and took courses at the college in, in viticulture. That's how dedicated she is to, to making sure she knows what she's talking about when she does a tour. So her tours are great. I've been on them. And her guests leave with an understanding and appreciation of Arizona wines. How many of you have had Arizona wine? Okay, almost everybody. Well, this, I hope this will encourage you to try it some more. So, uh, and on my left, as I said, is Paula Wolsey, my personal wine guru. And Paula has a long resume that I can't even begin to read. <laughs> but she is definitely a fine wine specialist, <coughs> Society of Wine Educators, Master Court of Sommeliers, uh, uh, Conf Conferir de la Chaine de Rotisseur, a very snitzy wine organization, wine and food. Uh, she had her own restaurant in Cottonwood called The Recovery Room. I don't know if you ever, uh, any of you were ever there. It was kind of my home away from home while it was open. She teaches at the college, she, and uh, she also had a wine shop So, in the, in the restaurant, if those of you who were there would know that. And as I say, she's the person to ask any question you have about wine, because I can almost guarantee you she'll answer it. <laughs> correctly, correctly. Correct. She actually knows what she's talking about. And then Tom Schumacher is a coordinator, has been both the coordinator and lead faculty for the art department on the Brady Valley campus of Yavapai College. His current duties include full-time teaching, shared between ceramics and photography. He has earned degrees in fine arts from Northern Kentucky University and the Rhode Island School of Design. On the Verde Valley campus, Tom has worked in many leadership positions, including campus executive dean, division assistant dean, and dean of instruction. From 1980 to 1985, he was director of the Clarkdale Art Center of Yavapai College in historic downtown Clarkdale. He's taught many classes in subject areas including jewelry, design, sculpture, photography, and digital photography. His most recent venture was the creation of the viticulture and enology programs for Yavapai College and developing the concept of the Southwest Wine Center. Um, I will mention that the Wine Center just broke ground, speaking of groundbreakings, on their winery on the college campus. And Tom, I'm sure, will tell you a little bit about that. He's a member of the Verde Valley Regional Economic Organization, former president of the Cottonwood Economic Development Council, and current president of the Verde Valley Wine Consortium. So we're going to start today with Tom. He's going to show a, a, a short PowerPoint that will give you some background. Then we'll move to Laura, uh, and then Paul and Tom, in whatever order they choose to go. <laughs> I'll let them decide. And I'll finish with a little bit about Sedona Wine Fest. So, 
Tom, okay. take it away. Great, and thank you. Thank you for inviting us this morning. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, what I'm going to go through here, and ex excuse me, I'm kind of getting over a cold or something, so um, it might sound a little off on my voice here. Um, I'm actually going to do this presentation tomorrow up here in Sedona at, at the Elks Lodge. That's where I thought I was going oh. this morning. Um, so this is, this is a great for me to go through it, and Paul and I reviewed it this morning, and uh, Paul encouraged me to show it today to you. So we'll go through this. Some, some of it uh, uh, may not necessarily be uh, right on for you folks, but I think there's a lot of great information here. Um, Primarily talking about the Southwest Wine Center, that's what we just broke ground for on, at Yavapai College. Um, oops. Let's do this correctly here. Uh, and for those of you who've never been to the, to the Verde Valley campus of the college, uh, this is what it typically looks like in the springtime here. Um, yeah, you folks can see it on, on the screen there. Hopefully it's all happening behind us. Um, and all these orange flowers that you see around the Verde Valley, I, I say people come up and steal them from the college and they plant them in their yards here. So uh, it's a beautiful place. Um, talking about the history a little bit of, of the wine industry, uh, did you know that during the 16th century, uh, Arizona and New Mexico actually grew more wine grapes than they do in California? So the history of wine in Arizona really goes back a, a long ways. And what it was was... Uh, the, the vineyards followed the mission, so they followed the churches because they used their wine for sacramental purposes. Um, everything was going great and went well, so what happened? Uh, what happened was prohibition. Uh, prohibition hit Arizona actually five years before it hit uh, the United States. So uh, in 1915, we, uh, Arizona went into prohibition. And I love this little uh, illustration there. Prohibition does prohibit in Arizona. Uh, <laughs> so before the nation went uh, dry, Arizona went dry. Um, it wasn't until the 1980s that Arizona started to recover from prohibition. And think about 1980s. Sandy was already living in Sedona in oh, 1980s. Yes. So. <laughs> um, what happened, you know, of course, prohibition failed. Um, and with prohibition failing, uh, it opened up a bunch of new doors. But unfortunately, it wasn't until 06 uh, that Arizona would actually allow wine to be sold in tasting rooms. 2006, that's, that's I mean, you, th you hear that number and you, you think surely that's a mistake, but it wasn't, wasn't until then. In that seven years time though, uh, Arizona now has uh, 86 tasting rooms and, and probably need to update that number too. It's probably closer closer to 100 now. Really? If there's about 87 Series 13 domestic farm winery licenses out there. Mm -hmm. So there's a few more tasting rooms than that. So uh, as Sandy mentioned uh, in, in one of my uh, other jobs or former jobs with the college, uh, one of the things that uh, I was asked to do, the, the college sits down there on 130 acres of land. Um, we currently use about 40 acres of it. And they said, you know, what are you going to do with the rest of that? Um, so we decided on planting a vineyard. Uh, and this is, this is the image. Uh, these, these little vines were six weeks old when I took this photograph. Uh, this is our first acre of grapes that went in. First acre of grapes planted in Clark, Clarkdale. And this goes back to 2010. Um, this year, we actually pulled about 800 pounds of grapes off of those vines. Um, but this was a vision of the community. In 2007, um, we actually commissioned an architect, uh, um, and I just forgot his name, uh, architect here in Sedona, uh, and we brought the community together and said, what do you think we could use this land for on the Verde Valley campus? And we came up with three concepts, and this was the concept that really kind of caught on. Um, all those little lines, you see those little green lines going up and down, uh, represent grapevines on campus. And this was the vision of the community. I like, I like to say this is all my idea. I brought this whole thing in there. But in the Verde Valley, the, by the name itself, the Green Valley uh, was an agricultural center. Um, at one time, it grew all the fruits and vegetables to supply the miners in Jerome. And at one point, they, you know, Give or take, I've heard many different numbers, between 50 and 60,000 people were living in Jerome, which is pretty incredible if you think about that. So this was, goes by, way back to 2007. Today, this is the picture of the Verde campus here. Uh, the big green square that you see is actually where 
we are planting grapes. That's about a, a, a 12 acre parcel up there. Uh, we have seven acres planted there currently. Uh, the little darker green is it's the next phase that's going to be planted this spring. And the smaller green, um, more to the center of the photo there, uh, is the first acre of grapes that was planted. And then the little, little green box there is the actual Southwest Wine Center. Um, the Viticulture and Enology program uh, was based on a plan. It wasn't just some idea somebody uh, came in with one night. Um, it was based on successful community college programs, uh, in particular at Am Allen Hancock uh, and Walla Walla Community Colleges. Um, Walla Walla has a program there that their wine program actually is the funding source for the entire college. And you and I couldn't buy a bottle of wine from them, only, they only sell to special people. Um, so we brought this to the president's uh, uh, executive leadership team uh, and it was approved in March of 2010. Uh, in 09, we started offering classes. Uh, Paula Wolsey taught the first uh, wine tasting class on campus. Uh, I remember we, that first night of class, our campus safety officer came in and pulled me out and said, you know they're serving wine in this class? And I said, yes, it's a wine tasting class. It's kind of part of the, part of the homework. So um, we had to get over some hurdles there. Uh, we planted that first acre of grapes. Uh, we offered three viticulture classes. Uh, Paula also taught a class up here in Sedona, wine appreciation course. And the interesting thing about all those classes is they always made with a waiting list. And for new classes being offered, that, that's very unusual. Usually you hope to get five to 10 people in these classes. These had 20 people and five more waiting. Um, continued on. Uh, and 11, 12, or excuse me, 10, 11, uh, offering more classes. Uh, we had a certificate program approved in 10. Um, the certificate classes kept going. In 11, 12, uh, we offered a new curriculum for enology, and, and I like to throw in there, uh, we, my, my simple definition of viticulture is the science of the vines, and enology is the science of the wine. So we had the viticulture portion going, um, so we have the curriculum now for enology. Uh, we put out an RFQ uh, request for a quote for the wine education facility back then. Uh, we submitted uh, grants to fund all this program. We actually hired a program director for viticulture and planted three additional acres of grapes on campus and graduated the first three graduates uh, of the viticulture program. Those three graduates, by the way, are all working now in the Verde Valley in various fields related to the wine industry. So they're, they're leaving with this degree that they've got in a one-year program, and they're getting, these, these are uh, nice jobs, nice benefit-paying jobs, so they're, they're making a comfortable living with these. Uh, last year, uh, we received a grant for equipment, a USDA grant, uh, and with that money, uh, we actually planted grapes on three local high school campuses. Uh, the most local one is Mingus High School, uh, but there's one in uh, Chino, at Chino High School, and in Humboldt High School District. Um, so these grapes, grapes are planted. Their ag students are actually working the grapes on campus there. So it, we're providing that step for them to, to move on into the enology and viticulture program. We hired a program director. Uh, we hosted the Verde Valley Wine Symposium, and we planted three additional acres of grapes. Where we are now, um, we are partnering up, the college is partnering up with the University of Arizona to become what, what we're calling the Knowledge Gateway and Data Repository for information relating to growing wine grapes in Arizona, in the desert southwest. Nothing like that has ever been done. Um, we harvested the first acre of grapes. We got about 800 pounds of grapes off that acre. Um, we're currently working with the city of Cottonwood uh, these additional acres of grapes that we're planting, um, kind of contrary to popular belief, grapes take very little water. Um, if you planted the traditional crops of, uh, in Arizona, which would be uh, your cotton, alfalfa, corn, things like that, uh, grapes take a tenth of the amount of water that it does for a similar acre. Uh, and the thing about grapes is they're only water a few months out of the year. Uh, the reclaimed water that we're going to get from the city of Cottonwood uh, will be water that has already been processed. 
Uh, so we'll become another uh, in repository of information on how you do this sustainable kind of uh, grape growing. Uh, we just had an event to promote the Southwest Wine Center. Uh, we raised over $107,000 at that single night event. Um, and this is all local uh, people at, at the event. Uh, we did officially do the groundbreaking for the Southwest Wine Center on November the 19th. Uh, we had almost 100 people or 100 plus people were there. Uh, the mayors from all the, the cities were there uh, and everyone was singing the praises of this. Uh, it, by the way, is the only, we are the only community college in, in Arizona and only one of three in the United States that have anything like this on campus. Uh, we're going to continue on with this vision, uh, which is to plant more grapes, uh, secure that irrigation water uh, in the university articulation. So we now offer a two-year degree in viticulture and oology. Uh, our idea is to then take it on to the university level so people can uh, go on to, to uh, baccalaureate type uh, degrees if they so desire. This is what the, the concept of the wine center is going to actually look like, and our big plan is to actually build this winery. Once the dust clears, uh, you'll see it's, it's a very sustainable building. It has this huge roof on it, and, and you'll see right in the front these two giant tanks. Uh, with the, the regular monsoon waters that we get, or the rains that we get, uh, and if you just use figures from last year, uh, we would have generated enough water catchment from that roof to run the whole winery for a whole year without using any ex outside water. So it'll be a zero water use building. Um, that includes flushing the toilets and hosing the place down and everything else. Um, the Southwest Wine Center, um, again, it's going to be unique in the state, unique in the United States. It's based on sustainability. Uh, these are all the sustainable elements that run into it. Uh, it's an adaptive reuse of an existing building. Uh, we're not tearing something down or building something new. Uh, there's a building on campus that we're actually renovating to become this winery. The giant roof I talked about a little bit, the, the rainwater capture, um, the wastewater that we don't use will be used to irrigate around it, uh, natural lighting and ventilation. Uh, it is currently, just the way it is written on paper here, uh, it's equivalent to a LEED certified silver building. And with the addition of photovoltaics, which we're working with APS on that, uh, we'll go up to LEED's gold standards. So as far as sustainability, it's a very, very nice use of the building. And a lot of people ask, why? Why are you doing that? Um, I like to point out to people some of the economic contributions to the Verde Valley that the wine industry has, has provided. Uh, now, these figures are, are kind of old, uh, but this is actually a study that the Verde Valley Wine Consortium uh, requested through uh, the University of Arizona. And this is way back in 2011. So some of these figures, even though they're old, I think you'll be uh, impressed by some of these numbers. Um, so in 910, uh, the tasting rooms were generating, uh, the wineries tasting room, over five and a half million dollars to the economy in the Verde Valley. And if you recall back in 910, um, that was when the economy was uh, uh, at, its, at its peak, if you can call it that, at uh, its lowest that it had been in how many years. Um, we were actually doing business uh, and doing uh, a profitable business at the time. Uh, all of the Arizona wine-related uh, industries uh, that come back to the Verde Valley are estimated to be in $25 million. And these are, these are figures back, remember, from 2011. Um, the ancillary industries and new businesses have come to the Verde Valley as a result of the wine industry. Uh, they figure a total of about $6.5 million. Uh, wine-related tourism, and I know we'll hear more about the tours and like that, uh, between Yavapai and Coconino counties, just on the wine industries, is estimated to be over $15 million. And the conservative growth estimate, now remember this is the University of Arizona study. Uh, they estimated with a 10% growth, uh, the impact uh, by 2015 would be uh, over $44 million. Well, last year, the wine industry grew 17%. And from all predictions, it's going to continue to grow at that same rate. Uh, so that's a lot of money that's coming into the Verde Valley from this industry in a lot of different ways. Uh, and I like to end it with this. Uh, so at the college, what, what we do and what the wine consortium, our, kind of our motto philosophy is, when we see an opportunity, we run with it. Uh, and you might recognize this game. Uh, 
we're, we're the guys here in the white. Here's our opportunity. Everybody else is watching what we're doing, and we just took off at it. And they're still trying to catch us, but um, we're just too far ahead of everybody right now. Um, and if we don't hurt ourselves, <laughs> we're going to continue on with this. So with that, I'll say cheers to you all. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Okay. Um, excellent, and we may come back to you if we have some extra time. I'd like to save all the questions till we're all finished talking, if that's okay. If you just think you won't remember it, then go ahead, but <laughs> we'd like you to save them till later. Okay, so Laura's going to go next and talk a little bit about the history in the Birdie Valley. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can everyone hear me okay? A little closer? Is that better? Okay. Uh, as a tour operator and a tour guide, I love the history, and so when I started doing tours here, I actually feel privileged that I was here at the right time, and I started out in the beginning with everybody else and watched the whole industry grow, and have been able to enlighten and entertain people and, ex and educate them on how all of this happened and give them the stories behind the winemakers and the history of the winemaking in this area, and that's what I'm going to give you a brief overview this morning. And it has been mentioned already, the missionaries were the first to bring wine to this area. They brought a grape called Mission Grapes, and they weren't really good. But they, they were a, a, acceptable for what they needed at that time. And, it wasn't, and that was, of course, in the 15 and 1700s. That was a long time ago. And it wasn't until the late 1970s that a fellow by the name of Gordon Dutt was actually working on some irrigation problems down in Yuma, and he needed a plant that didn't need a lot of water. And he brought in grapevines, and they did so well that he decided to start one of the first vineyards down in southern Arizona called Sonoida Vineyards, which is still there today. And of course, there are a lot of other wineries down and vineyards down in that area now. But up here in this area, the first the history actually started with Henry Sherman, who was mentioned earlier also. Some of you may have seen some of the exhibits here on occasion at the museum. He was over in, he and his wife lived over in Prescott. He was from Germany. She didn't speak any English. Someone owed him $500 and didn't have any money to pay them, so he offered him 160 acres of land that was over here in what is now Red Rock Crossing Crescent Moon Ranch. Some of you may be familiar with that area. And they didn't know much about ranching and farming. They weren't that much of pioneering folk. He was actually a baker by profession. But when they got over there, they saw the creek was there, and there were wild grapes growing along Oak Creek. And wherever wild grapes grow, wine grapes can grow. And so he decided to become a vintner. There were also peaches and apple trees and things like that. But with the miners and Jerome being such great drinkers, he had a growing audience and, a, and, and was able to sell it and make a lot of money on his wine. And of course, Prohibition started, and he didn't know the difference. He kept growing the grapes and making the wine. And the sheriff came and arrested him and put him in jail. And everybody got up in arms about it because he was such a good guy and he'd never done anything wrong. So he got a governor's pardon on the condition that he didn't make any more wine. And of course, as we've heard, it was a long time before things changed. But in 1992, John Marcus moved to this area, and he started, he wanted, he studied winemaking at UC Davis, and he also had 80 acres in Wilcox, and he planted the very first modern day vineyard. And around 2000, he had over 2,000 cases of Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Syrah, Zinfandel, and Merlot growing here. But he wasn't open to the public. He was just made it, sold it to five-star restaurants. And during this time, a fellow by the name of Eric Glomsky came through this area. And he was out hiking in the back country. And he came upon a lot of these old apple trees that had been on the homesteads here. Because, of course, Sedona was in this area. was a big apple-producing region. And he tasted the apples. And he liked them so much, he made apple wine. It actually smelled of the trees and the leaves and the rocks and the soil. And he called it liquid landscape. And he fell in love with winemaking and he went to California, studied under uh, a David Bruce winery and worked his way up to co-winemaker. And he came back here and this is when John Marcus had his vineyard going and he went to work for John to learn the art of blending, which is what Eric Lomsky and Page Spring Sellers are known for today. 
And he likes to tell the story this one day, this big black limousine pulls into the vineyard and this guy gets out with a gal dressed in all, in all black leather and he thinks, gee, they're in the wrong place. And it turned out to be the rock star Maynard Keenan and his girlfriend. Some of you may have heard of Maynard Keenan. He lives in Jerome now and he also has a vineyard and winery. And so Maynard had moved to this area and had wanted to learn about the wine industry and so he had approached John and of course with Eric being there, they became friends and eventually partnered. And between the two of them, they are the largest the producers of wine in Arizona. They established, Eric established Oak, uh, Page Springs Cellars. Maynard has Caduceus Cellars and they were partners in Arizona Stronghold. Up until recently, I think that's changing, but I'm not quite sure what the, all the latest is on that. But what happened is Eric said he was walking along the creek one day while he was still at John's and he looked over and he saw a piece of land and he thought, Gee, that would make a great place for a winery and a vineyard. And the very next day, the for sale sign went up. So he bought land that used to belong to Jim Page over on Page Springs Road. Uh, Page Springs is off 89A, heading down off of 89A towards Cornville. And um, he, start, he bought the, the property which had a barn on it. And when he built his his winery and, and he all blended it in to look like the same type of, of buildings. And it is a beautiful piece of paradise with the creek, with a creek running, or the um, Page Springs runs through there and also the creek. And he also bought land on the other side of the creek which now has another eight and a half acres of vineyards on it. So it looks a little bit like Italy. It is one of the most beautiful places in Arizona. And if you get a chance to go down there, walking down into the vines, you walk down to the creek, you get, there's a little area for picnic tables, and you can sit out and listen to the, to the creek flowing by, and it's just magnificent. But while all that was going on, another fellow by the name of Rod Snap had, has been here most of his life. He's been in the culinary industry for 30 years, and he had always wanted to have a vineyard. And he had a B&B, &B and he sold it, and with that money, he bought 21 acres on the side of the hill on Page Springs Road, a little bit south of where, um, or north, whichever way you're going, of what, where is now Page Springs, Cellars. And he sold half of the land, and with his 10 and a half acres, he started Havelina Leap. And then the other 10 and a half acres were bought by Deb Wall and her husband, and they started Oak Creek Vineyards. And the two are right next to each other on a hill near water, and that is one of the best places you can be for making grapes, or for making wine, or growing grapes, as all of these vineyards are. They're on a hill near water. And so, even though they're right next to each other, their wines are totally different. Um, broad snaps are very, very dry and bold, and he's known as a red house. They only were making red wines up until this year. They're gonna start to make some whites. And then Deb's have, Deb Wall, who comes, actually comes from um, Germany, Australia, South Africa, and the Caribbean. She has a quite eclectic background and has brought in more of a European flair to her wines. And so between them, their, their wines taste totally different and yet they're right there on the same hillside. And as these wineries progressed, they had to have the soil tested and they had to know the, the wind velocity and the slant of the land and all of that goes into the kind of grapes that you grow on the side of the hill. And then she also has 50 almond trees on her property and she grows almonds for, for just consumption, but um, it's very fertile over there also. And then while all that was going on, um, Bob, um, Barbara and Bob Predmore uh, started what is called Alcantara Vineyards and that's over off of 260, halfway between I-10, and, I mean I-17 and Cottonwood. And Barbara and Bob looked around for a number of years looking for the perfect place to have a winery. They'd been sitting in Tuscany enjoying a glass of wine. Barbara said, you know, I think we're, we should start a winery. Well, they're getting ready to retire. So then this isn't a, this isn't a feast, feat for the, for the faint of heart. And so they looked around and finally found 87 acres on the confluence of Oak Creek and the Verde River. She has a... Um, beachfront property actually where they meet right on her on her land and is eventually going to have a village there because you need about at least 100 acres to be profitable and 87 acres wasn't going to do it and only 35 of those are actually going to be planted they have about 17 now so they decided to put in a village and that's what's going on right now they started with an outdoor um, 
<coughs> a wedding chapel, which they use because they do a lot of weddings already. And then they're going to have a B&B, a &B, some villas, a doggy hotel, because they're big doggy, owner, doggy lovers. They're going to have a one-seating Italian restaurant, and the chef they're bringing over from Tuscany demands his own olive oil, so she planted olive trees to make her own olive oil. They're going to have a, an Italian bistro and an amphitheater for Shakespearean plays and maybe some boutiques and shops, and that's all down the road. There's like a 10-year plan in place right now. But they built a Tuscan-style villa, and if you haven't been out there, it's surrounded by verdant vineyards sitting in the U of the Verde River, and it is another perfect piece of paradise out in a high desert region. And what I've found and have come to admire in all of these winemakers is that they can take a piece of land here in northern Arizona, where most people come here and think it's totally desert with saguaros growing everywhere, and they've taken this piece of land and they've turned it into a vineyard, a beautiful piece of paradise. And so it takes a certain type of person to do that. And all of these have the love of the land and the love of the vine comes first, and that's what you experience when you go to any of these wineries. You can appreciate the work that's gone into, uh, to, that these people have done to bring all of this to fruition. And another little interesting fact I learned along the way, actually at one of um, Sandy's uh, wine, uh, uh, wine fest, Orion Bread Company, when they, they mix their flour and water, some of you may have had the Orion Bread bread that's sold over in Old Town Cottonwood. And they would drive up Page Springs Road and they'd have the sourdough yeast in, their back, in the back of their truck and it would pull the yeast from the, I mean they had their sourdough in, in the back of the truck and it would pull the yeast from the air that was coming from the vineyards and it grabs it up and starts the fermentation process in the dough. So if you're ever having any of their sourdough bread, you're getting a little bit of the vine in it also. So it's been a real experience to be involved in all of this and to watch how it's grown and to see the college starting and people getting jobs and the economy changing. And along with that, to meet these wonderful people who have started all of these vineyards. If you haven't been out to any of them, I encourage you to do so. Walk around the vines, talk to the owners if they're there, and you'll get a real feel and appreciation for what's going on here. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. And now we'll move to, to uh, Paula. I, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> oh, you, Paula can talk a little bit maybe about the, why, why this really is a good region. For well, is that on? It's on. Yeah. Okay. There's a lot of reasons why this is a good region. Um, let me say first of all that I just stopped working for Arizona Stronghold. I was there for five years as the director of sales. I'm the person who went, traveled all around the United States and Canada selling Arizona wine. Arizona Stronghold is now in 40 states, four provinces, and Australia. Y you live here, there's a lot of people who live here don't re realize we have a wine region. Well, there's a lot of people outside of Arizona that do. And this wine region happens to be growing in a fashion. I've, I came from the San Francisco Bay Area. My father was in the wine industry. My grandfather was a winemaker. I watched and have been in the wine industry for 20 years living here. And I've watched this happen, growth, growth come to a region, Walla Walla, Paso Robles. It's never hurt a community or a region to see a wine community start, be built, to come into be. It's never hurt property values. You know, people don't come to Arizona to watch corn grow. You know, they're gonna come to Arizona and they're going to come for us. We're lucky in northern Arizona. They're already on their way to Sedona. They're already on their way to the Grand Canyon. Now we're offering them something else in addition to, and people are now starting to come for the wine region. This area, and you wonder why there are no grapes growing in Sedona now. You know, I'll take issue with the fact that when the, when the original Spanish were coming in and discovering the Verde Valley for the first time. The Verde Valley was called Valle de Uva, which is Valley of the Grape. And we're talking along the Verde River. We're talking the valley was so thick with um, indigenous grapes that they had difficulty getting to the river. Right? Now that's obviously changed. There's still wild grapes growing in Arizona. But just because wild grapes grow, which they grow anywhere in the United States, you can't grow good grapes for wine anywhere. 
And there is a reason why there aren't any in Sedona right now, because it is difficult here. There are certain specific uh, growing conditions that need to happen. And one thing, when you look at Arizona, when you, people say, grapes in Arizona? I mean, it was true. It wasn't until 2006 that we had the ability to, to boom this industry. Where we grow grapes in Arizona is in the mountains. It's high elevation. Okay, we're not growing grapes. You can grow grapes in the desert. There's plenty of grapes, table grapes growing. There's a specific type of grape that you have to grow to make good wine. The species, it's called Vitis vinifera. Vitis vinifera originated in what is now modern day Iran in Persia. It's a desert crop. It doesn't need a lot of water. It doesn't need a lot of water. In fact, it, it doesn't like a lot of water. It has a much better time growing out of rocky and, and weak soil conditions, very rocky. Doesn't like a lot of iron, which is one of the main reasons why you don't see a lot of grapes growing in the sides of in Sedona. And it doesn't like to be too high. Okay, so it, we grow grapes in Arizona between, to grow good wine, 3,500, 5,000 feet. There's a couple of instances like Maynard has a vineyard in Jerome. We have a vineyard down in uh, Calibri, which is at about 5,500 feet. We've got a nutcase up in Williams that's got 200 acres. But what he's growing there is not Vitis vinifera. Vitis vinifera can only survive in these specific kind of a slice. We are very similar here in Arizona <coughs> to what's happening in Argentina. When you think of great wine regions around the world, the most important thing that most of them have in common are large bodies of water that are tossing a cooling influence into the afternoon or the morning areas of these regions. So think California, the whole coast. Think Italy, think France. Where these places are growing grapes, the Rhine, in, in, in Germany, large bodies of water, the Finger Lakes region, they come in, the grapes like to struggle. That's part of what makes them interesting, which makes good wine. You know, anybody can grow grapes anywhere. That's true, but can you make good wine out of it? You know, do they make great wine in Missouri? No. Do they make great wine in Indiana? No, there are a 350,000 case winery I've been to in Indiana. What are they using to make that wine? Fruit, they're not using Vitis vinifera. Hence, you don't know them as a great wine region. You know California, you know Oregon, you know Washington. If you're into the wine world, you'll maybe know New Mexico and you might know Texas. There are wineries in every state in this union. In Hawaii, they make wine out of pineapples. Sparkling wine, it's pretty tasty. What we have here in Arizona is a specific climate that allows for, in the morning, and you guys live here, you know this, it's cold, and in the night, in, in this thick summertime, or think after June, it's cold, cool, warm, warm, hot. That swing from the cold to the heat of the day is called the diurnal shift. Grapes love that. And what we do with elevation is the same thing that California does with the fog. It starts out cool, and then it gets hot, and then it gets cool, and then it gets hot. That diurnal shift is what creates one of the conditions that creates really complex complexities in the grapes. It makes them interesting, it makes good wine. Arizona has the second largest diurnal shift in the world after Argentina. So that when people say, how do you do it there? Well, you say, we're in the mountains and we have a really good temperature swing. Tell them that. Our biggest issue here in our area, and northern Arizona too, is we have too much water and it's too cold. People say, what? It's the exact opposite of what we would think is the problem. Okay, when you're growing grapes, what happens in June? In comes the water. We don't even turn on irrigation, except for baby grapes, the first three years or so. You know, the, the grapes get harvested, then they go dormant for the winter. And it's not the winter cold that's the issue. It's the, here comes the May frost and wipes out everybody's apricot trees and cherry trees. We've got the buds on things and boom, we inevitably, you know, 2010, uh, 2011, we had a 26 degree day here in May. Guess what that does to baby vines? Not a good thing. The little buds, they're gone. Wipes out your crop. And then the too much water happens as these grapes are growing up in the, in the summertime. We harvest usually start, we're in mid-August, and it goes from August to end October for making wine. We have monsoons, and they come hardcore sometimes, as you well know. 
Too much water when a grape is trying to develop its sugars is not a good thing either. And there can be conditions with mold. They get wet and then they don't have a time to dry out. So those are the big issues that we have. We've learned how to trellis around most of these issues. We do a lot of praying and we wind up with some pretty good wines. Arizona uh, has been able to glean absolutely top honors in many, many competitions that you're probably not aware of. San Francisco International Wine Competition, uh, San Francisco Chronicle, Houston Rodeo. There's been some amazing things with the Jefferson Cup. Uh, around the wine world, Arizona's being looked at now as a serious place to do it. So those are essentially the reasons why we do it here. Low water use is something that people love to hear. You know, keeps it on a beautiful, they just love that idea. Okay, good. Sustainability is the way we should do it, just because it's the way we should do it. It's not about being cool. If you think about regions and cultures that have survived in, this, in the world, after great catastrophes, after great wars, you need two things. You need a church and you need a winery. Without those two things, you got nothing. People aren't gonna come back to your region. This is what creates culture and this is what we're trying to do with our wine region. We all live here because we wanna be here. We moved here and we're into wine before there was a wine region here. So this is something that is new to the area, but it isn't new. It's about creating something that will be here for our kids and for your grandkids and you know, people who want to come and visit us, come see it. It's about a, a lifestyle and I, I think it fits pretty good into the region. Good? Yes, thank you. Well, so, so now you know why I'm so interested in wine. I just find it endlessly interesting. There is so much that you can know about growing wine, about making wine. I'll never know it all, and so it always gives me something new to learn, and I love that. I think Laura's the same way. Mm -hmm. We both like it for that reason. And Paula, speaking of church, and what did you say? <laughs> church? Yeah, you you need a vineyard, and yeah, you, need a, you need a winery in your church. Guess what? She's <laughs> going to build a, vin a, a, a winery in a church. Yeah, I bought a church. Uh, but let me preface it by saying I also put a restaurant in a hospital and called it the asylum. And I did that until I sold it in 2010. So it's, it's a little bit expected of me. So after I, I uh, quit Arizona Stronghold, I started a consulting business called the Cellar Door Unhinged. And it's about everything that has to do with the wine industry. Myself and the business manager and the winemaker from Arizona Stronghold all left and are now starting. We bought a church in Old Town and we're calling the winery Revelation Wines. It's in cotton. It's in cotton. cotton. So old it'll, town it'll be an actual working winery amongst all these tasting rooms in Old Town. Next year it should be there. So I know we're running short on time. I'm going to talk just a little bit about Sedona uh, Wine Fest, and then we'll open it up for questions. So Sedona Wine Fest started in 2009, which was, I think, when you gave the first classes in Yavapai College. So, so that was our first year. Uh, it started as a part of the community fair, which was a city of Sedona activity, free activity for, for families and kids mostly. Mm -hmm. But uh, some of you may know um, Al Camello and Chandra Jefferson. They were running the fair at that time. And Al said, well, we decided we'd like to have a wine tent at the community fair and see how that goes. So I said, well, I could do that. I know people at the wineries and I know people at the city. So what I didn't know was all about the licensing issues, and that was interesting to learn. So because a wine festival has a specific liquor license, there's all kinds of different liquor licenses in Arizona. And wine festival licenses are a thing unto themselves, and they, you have to have the farm winery license to be able to get one. You can't, no, we can't have distributors there. So wine fest is always all Arizona wineries, and, we, and, and, and we've had both Southern Arizona, Prescott area, and uh, the Verde Valley, of course. We have more from the Verde Valley because we're closer and it's easier. But there's a lot of interplay between the Verde Valley and the Southern Arizona industry because many of the Verde Valley wineries have vineyards in Southern Arizona. So um, in the first year, we had about 700 people between two days, and we have now grown to probably around 3,000 or more. Uh, and after a couple of years, we started selling tickets online. And the first year, we just took cash. You know, <laughs> that's all. Started really small. I, I, 
I put it together in something like seven weeks, which is ridiculous, but it wasn't anything like it is now. Now we're in a, a tent that's very close to 10,000 square feet, a big tent up at the airport. So how many of you have been to Sedona Wine Fest? Anybody? Oh. <laughs> okay, well, you have to come. This is the fourth weekend in September every year. And uh, this year we had the best weather we've ever had. It was really beautiful. It was in the 70s. It wasn't too hot. It wasn't too cold. Um, and we had 16 wineries, including a meadery. For the first time, we had a meadery. We had, it's a wine, they have a wine license. It is wine, it's honey wine. It's one of the oldest still beverages in, in history. I mean, it's really old. And it's quite different, it was very good. I was really excited to have them. We also added, uh, two years ago, year before last, we added a premium area. And you get a, a stemmed, big, bigger stemmed wine glass and of course you pay more money for it, but you have a little area to yourselves and we serve wines in the premium area that you can't get out on the floor of the general wine fest. But it's been a success. We're, we expanded it last year. We'll probably expand it in some ways again next year and more, add more food. We also have, of course, other vendors. We have food. Uh, we have music. We have art and a raffle, and in, we've even had cigars. So um, about 75% of our, our, our visitors are from out of town. And last year, in addition to other things, and we add something new every year. Last year, we added an education tent. And it was very successful. So next year, we'll be expanding that, making it bigger, um, bigger and better every year. So uh, I really enjoyed having that. I've always wanted to have that, just haven't always had the time to do it, but we're, we're, we're going with it now. We also had um, a collaboration with a, a local theater company, and we had a spoken word event in the tent on Saturday night. That was a challenge. I'm not, I'm not sure we'll do that again, but it was interesting. And it was a show, it was all written specifically for Winefest. It was a spoken word event all about wine different vignettes about wine from, from um, throughout history. And we were also on, a, a, Paula and Tom and I were on a radio show that the um, uh, Democrats of the Red Rocks put on about the wine industry. They just thought it's so interesting what the wine industry is doing here in the Verde Valley that they had us all on their, on their regularly scheduled radio show once a week and we got to talk about it there. And the film festival showed wine-themed movies during the week of Wine Fest. So uh, one of them was about the process of becoming a, a, a what's the? A sommelier. A sommelier, but a particular. Master som. Master sommelier, which is, there's only something like. 300. Like, there's very, very few in the in world. In the world. So hard. I mean, it was just incredible to watch them go through the process. It was just amazing. So. The thing that I always like to say about the wine industry is that it's a great economic engine for Arizona in general, not just the Verde Valley, but all of Arizona. And all of Arizona benefits from it. And, and as Tom said, it grew during the recession. It didn't just stay the same, it grew during the recession. Now, not much you can say that about in Arizona. Maybe the healthcare industry, but I, don't, I can't think of much else that grew during the recession, and the wine industry did. So it brings tax dollars to the Verde Valley. It's revitalized Old Town Cottonwood. For those of you who have been through Old Town in the last year or two, good grief, it's incredible what it's done for Old Town, and it's still happening. Um, it provides jobs, as Tom said, for young people. So as long as I've been here, one of the problems...